Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about today is this idea of a government failure. Um, we've already talked about market failures and what that means. So a market failure is when the prices get messed up and then that means the signal of how to act in a market gets messed up and people overpay or underpay or buy too much stuff or buy too little stuff and then um, markets get messed up. So that's a market failure. Um, a government failure is slightly different. Um, a government failure is really just a failure of political accountability. Um, where they're not living up to their responsibilities as governments that have special powers in this market. Um, and so if we go back to Spider-Man here, in the latest Spider-Man, um, the Into the Spider-Verse um, animated version, um, they distort that original Uncle Ben phrasing of with great power comes great responsibility. Um, what they say here is with great ability becomes great accountability. And so governments, because they have all of this enormous power in society, have the responsibility to be accountable to their citizens and to respond to citizen concerns and, and, and demonstrate that accountability. And once you have a failure of accountability, that is what turns into a government failure. Um, there are three general reasons for, a, for government failures. Um, the core readings discuss these. Um, you can have economic infeasibility, you can have administrative infeasibility, and you can have political infeasibility. So any of these different levels, these, this economic level, administrative level, and political level, these can all mess up government accountability and make it so that the government won't actually do what it was supposed to do. Um, from the economic inf infeasibility side, this is this idea that any public policy that you set has to be a Nash equilibrium to be successful. That is a term we have not covered yet. We're talking about it in the next section. So don't worry about this Nash equilibrium. What this really just means is if you try to set a policy and people's natural inclination is going to not be to follow it because the incentives are messed up or the incentives are not aligned, then people are going to ignore that policy and go back to kind of what is the most logical outcome. Um, the example the book gave here um, was with Salvador Allende um, in Chile. He, was, um, he promised that when he got elected, he would nationalize all of the industries in Chile. Um, and so he did. And as a result, the stock market in Chile totally crashed and the economy like sunk in Chile. And that was because that was the natural reaction um, for people in society and for companies in the country. Um, where it wasn't the best policy for both parties, for the government and for the, um, for the, the, the free market, for the, the, uh, the companies in the country. And so as a result, as soon as the policy was set, everybody kind of went to a different outcome that was not anticipated. Um, and so you can have, you can create some sort of new policy, but if it's not going to work well and if people are not going to respond to it, then um, it's not going to work and it's going to cause a government failure. The administrative feasibility side of this is you might have a really good policy um, and you know that people aren't going to run, run away from it and people are actually going to follow it. Um, but if there's not enough state capacity to make sure that people actually follow it or that you can administer the law or the policy, then it's not going to work and you're not going to be able to be held accountable for the policy that you make. This could be because of limited information. You don't know enough about the people that you're trying to, to legislate for. And so you might make some law that makes sense on paper and they'll try to follow it, but it doesn't actually reflect reality. It could also be limited capacity. You could pass some really complicated law that requires all sorts of like information gathering through smartphones or something. Um, and then you get tons and tons of data. And then you, you as the intern sits there in front of the computer and says, ah, and you have no idea what to do with the data. And so the law just kind of fails because you don't know what to do with it um, without expertise to actually um, implement the policy and make sure it's working, then it's it's going to fall apart. Um, that's why you're getting an MPA or an MPP so that you can be a good public administrator and have the ability to um, administer these policies well so that there isn't a government failure. You have a responsibility to um, citizens to undertake these laws correctly and well. Um, and so you're here so that you can avoid government failure in the future. Um, 
The third type of government failure is this idea of politics and political feasibility, where even if you have a good policy and you have all of the state capacity to make sure it works, you have people who can analyze all of the data, you have everything in place for the thing to work, it can still die because of politics um, for a host of reasons. Um, you can have short-termism, which is this idea that politicians will often only adopt policies that will help them win the next election. And so if there's a policy that needs to um, take place over the next 50 years, um, like addressing climate change or something, no politician's going to want to touch that because um, it's not going to help them get reelected or it will hurt their chances of reelection in the future. And so they just avoid it. So even though you might have really good policies, you might have all sorts of inf infrastructure in place to do it, it's not going to get done. Um, you also have unequal access to the political system. This is going back to the idea of having small groups and big groups. Um, you might have small groups who are very, very involved in the political um, um, process. And then even though you might have like a really good policy, they're going to choose a policy that kind of favors one specific group. And um, it could end up being um, kind of an unaccountable system that is a type of government failure. Um, and also voting itself. Um, can mess up um, government accountability. And we'll talk about this at the end here, um, where depending on the order of voting and the options that you, prevent, you present to voters, um, you, can, you can have some power in which things get um, selected through a voting process that is democratic. Um, and so with these three things here, um, you can have all sorts of government failures. So we're gonna talk about each of these um, more in depth here. So the short termism idea is that again, you're going to implement policies that will help you get elected in the next cycle. And that's all you're going to care about. This um, unequal access idea is that the rich and the small groups will have louder voices, and they'll be able to get involved directly in the policy process. Um, this is why I had you do that three part a podcast series on the regulation of peanut butter in the United States. Um, hopefully this was fascinating for you. Um, because it was it's a very deep dive into the regulation of one specific food product um, and all of the regulations behind it and all of the different lobbying organizations. You had um, the actual peanut butter manufacturers that were using the, the regulation process to compete with each other and to try to lock competitors out by changing specific um, percentages of, of peanut butter requirements. Um, you had groups of, of citizens um, that were able to influence the, the policy making and the rule making process here. But the only way that worked is because um, the peanut butter grandma was able to um, organize a small, passionate group of pro peanut butter people. Um, on her own, she would not have been able to have as much influence as she did. Um, she had all of that influence because she was a small interest group or led a small interest group and was able to um, discuss um, and weigh in on the policy making process and the rule making process. And so this, this whole story of peanut butter regulation is kind of just a really, really interesting case study of how rulemaking works and how interest groups get involved in it um, and who has access to the, the rulemaking process. Um, we see this nowadays with um, politicians that are promising to remove legislation and um, get rid of all sorts of regulations. Um, but in the end, what the podcast argued is that like, even though it seems absurd to have um, reams and reams of paper describing of what makes peanut butter, um, there's possibly a good reason for that. There's a paper trail. We have accountability processes in place to make it so that food is safe. Um, it was the product of a democratic process. It was the product of um, an open rulemaking process. So even though um, industry executives were able to get in and get their voice heard, citizens were also involved in the rulemaking process. And so getting rid of all sorts of regulations and kind of shrinking it down um, isn't necessarily like a good thing. These regulations exist for a reason um, and are the results of kind of citizen involvement and industry involvement and are often kind of a good system. And so hopefully um, that was kind of the gist of, of having you um, listen to those those podcasts there. Um, you also have an issue with government failure with lobbyists and who has access to the government. Um, and so I had you read a couple articles about this, this rotating, this revolving door here, 
or you have politicians that are um, trying to, to make legislation and then they leave office and they become lobbyists for specific industries because those industries love using former members of Congress because they know they have friends still in Congress, they know the ins and outs of the system, and so they can send people back into Congress um, to help their policy preferences get enshrined in law. Um, and so that is potentially a bad thing for democracy because if you can afford to um, pay a lobbyist to help your policy get put in place. Um, that generally means that you have lots of money. And if you don't have lots of money, you can't afford a lobbyist and then you don't get that access. Um, it can also do weird things to the policy preferences of the lobbyists themselves. So John Boehner was Speaker of the House for a few years um, during the Obama administration, um, a Republican um, congressman. And he was very anti anything about uh, marijuana, uh, medical marijuana, legalization of marijuana. Um, but in 2018, he suddenly joined the board of one of the main marijuana lobbying organizations. Um, and then he has this tweet, this tweet here that says his thinking on cannabis has, involved, has evolved. Um, sure, people change their policy preferences, but it also probably evolved because he was getting paid to have it be evolved. Um, and so like, it's a fascinating example of like how um, people's individual like political ideologies are shaped by money. Um, and so then he has access to um, Congress and his friends in Congress, and he's able to kind of promote um, medical marijuana legislation. And so um, it's a, a fascinating mini case study of how that works. Um, but then it can also cause bad things to happen. Um, one of the reasons why it is so difficult and convoluted to do your taxes in the United States compared to other countries is because the tax preparation industry, um, led by like H&R Block and Intuit, who does uh, TurboTax, um, they don't. They make tons and tons of money on selling tax software to people and selling tax services to people um, on the internet, and so they have been. Um, lobbying Congress heavily um, over the past 20 years to make it so that um, people have to essentially use their services to um, pay taxes. Um, they've been trying to pass laws that bans the IRS from offering um, free tax filing services um, and giving them a monopoly over tax filing services and giving them a kind of the only way to file taxes is through H&R Block and, and TurboTax and other systems. Um, and it's because they have a strong lobbying ability. Um, and so this every few years, especially like around April, we get all sorts of news stories about like the latest lobbying efforts of these tax companies um, to get it to make it so that people um, have to use their services. Um, and it's a bipartisan thing. They're really good at lobbying kind of both sides of the both political parties to get all sorts of, of backing here. And so there's this bipartisan effort to kind of prop up H&R Block and TurboTax and, and make it so that um, they keep um, their monopoly on, on tax software here. Um, and they donate directly to political, political campaigns so that they can um, get that access. Um, well, we as individual citizens, we're not able to get that same level of access. Um, in political science research, um, um, researchers have been trying to kind of measure quantitatively how much access people have and which types of people um, can talk to Congress and which people are kind of locked out of talking to their Congress people. Um, and so I had you um, look at a short version of this article here um, where this was a, a field experiment that these uh, two political scientists ran where they sent out um, a whole bunch of fake emails to people um, in Congress saying, I am a concerned citizen or I am a business owner or I am a whatever. And then I want to talk to the Congress person. And then they tracked the responses to those emails to see um, who, like, which of their fake personas got assigned to which people in the in the congressperson's office. And what they found here is that if the person said, "I have donated to your campaign," "I've donated a sizable amount," um, they were way more likely to get connected directly to that member of Congress. Um, if they didn't reveal that they were a donor, they were often just um, uh, funneled down to the legislative assistant or the district director or to district staff. Um, but as soon as they revealed that they were donors, then they got um, kind of better access and were able to contact the chief of staff or the deputy chief of staff or the legislative director or the member of Congress itself or themselves. Um, and so, again, like 
the people who have access to the political system are essentially the people with money, um, which means if you don't have money and you don't have the ability to um, get into these congressional discussions, then it's really hard to get your policy preferences heard. Um, and that is potentially a reflection of, of a type of government failure there. Um, the third type of political failure that you can often have is in voting itself. Um, we love voting. Voting is a form of, it's, it's how we um, express democratic um, preferences here. But depending on how voting systems are set up, they can also end up non-democratic. Um, so a good example of this is if we have three people here, we have Anil and Bala and Carlos, conveniently A, B, and C here. Um, they might have specific preferences on what they want to have for lunch. Um, they have to decide some restaurant to go to, and they have specific preferences in the types of food that they like. So Anil, um, his favorite food is pizza, and then if he can't get pizza, then he'll have um, hamburgers, and if he can't have hamburgers, then he'll have soup. And so soup is his least favorite of those three options, um, but he really likes pizza. So Bala has similar preferences, but they're kind of rearranged. He loves soup. That's the best. Um, pizza is his second favorite, and then hamburgers are his third favorite. Um, and so Carlos, his preferences are the same three foods, but in a different order. Um, he would love to have hamburgers first, um, then soup, and then pizza is his, list, his least favorite here. Um, so what ends up happening, though, in this situation is let's say they decide they're going to vote for lunch. They get together and they say, all right, everybody raise their hand if you want pizza. And if they do that, only one person is going to raise their hand. Um, if they all raise their hands for soup, um, only Bala is going to vote for soup, and then only Carlos is going to vote for hamburgers. So there's a three-way tie. Nothing's going to get done. So then one of them says, how about we just vote for two of the options, and then the winner of that option, um, we can use that and have that be voted against with the other one that we leave out. So you just vote for two at a time. That way you're guaranteed to get a winner. So let's say Anil says, let's vote between pizza and soup and see which one wins. Um, or so what happens is um, Anil will vote for pizza, Bala will, will vote for soup, so it's tied right now. Carlos will vote for soup, which means soup wins. And so then soup will go on to the second round of soup versus burgers. Um, and so then they have to vote soup versus burgers. So Anil will vote for hamburgers, Bala will vote for soup, and Carlos will vote for hamburgers, which means um, in the order that we just did with um, pizza versus soup and then soup versus hamburgers, if we wrote down which one was most preferred, we said that pizza is not as good as soup and soup is not as good as hamburgers. And so we kind of have an ordering there where we say, like, if we had to rank these things, pizza would be three, soup would be two, hamburgers would be one. The hamburgers are definitely the number one best food, and so they should go get hamburgers. The issue with that, though, is that only worked because of the pairs of foods that we presented and the order that we presented them in. So we did pizza and soup first, but let's say they say, let's vote between um, soup and hamburgers first. So if they do that, let's walk through the same process. Bala would vote for soup, Carlos would vote for soup, or Carlos, Carlos would vote for hamburgers, because that's what we're doing, soup versus hamburgers. So Carlos would vote for hamburgers, and Anil would vote for hamburgers which means soup would be out of the running. Um, so now we have to vote between hamburgers and um, pizza because that was the third option here. So we're gonna bring pizza back in. So Anil will vote for pizza, Bala will vote for pizza, and Carlos will vote for hamburgers, which means hamburgers loses. So if we start off with this other pairing of foods, the ordering of which is the best food for the group of three, when we did it the first time, hamburgers was the best, Soup was the second best, pizza was the least favorite. But if we reverse the order, suddenly that order changes um, and hamburgers are no longer the best. Hamburgers got knocked out in one of the early rounds. Um, and so what we end up having is something called intransitive voting. So if, if we look back at this, we have pizza better than burger, burger better than soup, soup is better than pizza. Um, but this is suddenly messed up because if you translated these to numbers, for instance, five is greater than four, that makes sense. Four is greater than three, that makes sense. And then if this is a three, three is greater than whatever number we made up for pizza, I think that was five. Three is greater than five. That is wrong. 
um, three is not greater than five. So what we end up happening, ha what we end up happening here is this is called intransitive voting, where this violates the transitive property of math here, where like one number, if x is greater than y and y is greater than z, then z has to be greater than x. But that's not the case here. We, we messed that up. And this is something called the Condorcet Paradox. It was discovered by some um, French political scientists a long time ago. And so basically what we have is this idea of vote intransitivity, um, where just because of the ordering of the votes, the ordering is what determines what is the best option and what is the least best option. It's not that soup is inherently better than pizza. It's just because of the, the order of the pairs that we presented. Um, and so this happens in real life. If you have power over an agenda, um, a voting agenda, if you're like the Speaker of a House um, or um, kind of the, the person who has the, uh, the control over what issues get voted on in a city council, if there are three different policies and you want one of them to win and you kind of know everybody's policy preferences, you can set, you can get like the number two and the number three um, options and set them against each other so that the number two option gets beat and then you can have number one and number three go against each other and then number one is guaranteed to win. And so if if in this uh, food example here, if Anil has the power to choose um, which options should be voted on first and he really wants pizza, then he is going to make it so that pizza is guaranteed to win. If Bala has the power to choose which two options get voted on in which order, he has the power to make it so soup wins. And Carlos, the same thing. He has power to make it so that hamburgers win. Um, and so that can actually distort um, the democratic process and this idea of, of voting. And so the order of the voting matters here. And so the Speaker of the House or whoever is in charge of the agenda could theoretically guarantee whatever outcome they want if they have perfect information about everybody's preferences. If you're in Neil and you know the ordering for Bala and Carlos, then you can choose whatever you want for lunch because you have the political power to do that, um, which kind of distorts this whole democratic process and uh, makes it so the governments aren't necessarily accountable to the general public because um, the agenda setters can choose whatever policies they want because of this, this vote and transitivity. Um, so with all of those, those government failures, there are all sorts of ways that the government can mess up um, and distort policies and um, it can be bad. So watch out for those um, as you um, work in the public sector, pay attention to government failures and make sure that you are remaining accountable to the public.